Welcome to Faith Moments with Dina Marie, a weekly podcast to ponder and to proclaim our Sunday Mass readings. And welcome to the second Sunday in Ordinary Time in the middle of January. Here we are, January 16th marks our second Sunday in Ordinary Time. And I'd like to begin this time together with a prayer that I learned about a few years ago. Maybe some of you have heard of it as well. It's called Mary Undoer of Knots. And if you go online, there's many different versions of this prayer. I'm going to be taking it from this booklet, Prayer for All Occasions. This comes from the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C., and it's a compilation of Marian prayers. And I, I like this version of the prayer of Mary Undoer of Knots. And as we open today's program with this prayer, I would invite you to Consider the knots that are in your life, the knots that are in your particular community that you may be facing right now that you feel are a knot that you would like to have Mary undo. Let us pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Virgin Mary, faithful mother who never refuses to come to the aid of your children, mother whose hands never cease to help because they are moved by the loving kindness that exists in your immaculate heart. Cast your eyes of compassion upon me and see the snarl of knots that exist in my life. You know all the pains and sorrows caused by these tangled knots. Mary, my mother, I entrust to your loving hands the entire ribbon of my life. In your hands, there is no knot which cannot be undone. Most Holy Mother, pray for divine assistance to come to my aid. Take this knot, the knot of cancer, the knot of the coronavirus, the knot of division, into your mater maternal hands this day. I beg you to undo it for the glory of God once and for all in the name of your divine son, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Mary, undoer of knots, pray for us. Just think, as we hear about Mary in the gospel reading today, what a beautiful prayer to think about and to ask for her intercession. Well, today our readings take us into the prophet uh, Isaiah, and also into the Psalms, of course, we'll hear from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, and we will be hearing from this letter over the course of the next few weeks. So let us begin by hearing the reading for the first reading of our scriptures. And this is from the book of Isaiah chapter 62, verses one through five. For Zion's sake, I will not be silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet until her vindication shines forth like the dawn and her victory like a burning torch. Nations shall behold your vindication and all the kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name pronounced by the mouth of the Lord. You shall be a glorious crown in the hand of the Lord, a royal diadem held by your God. No more shall people call you forsaken or your land desolate, but you shall be called my delight and your land espoused for the Lord delights in you and makes your land his spouse. As a young man marries a virgin, your builder shall marry you. And as a bridegroom rejoices in his bride, so shall your God rejoice in you the word of the Lord. Our Psalm is Psalm 96. Proclaim the marvelous deeds to all the nations. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all you lands. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim his marvelous deeds to all the nations. Announce his salvation day after day. Tell his glory among the nations among all peoples, his wondrous deeds. Proclaim his one marvelous deeds to all the nations. Give to the Lord, you families of nations. Give to the Lord glory and praise. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. 
proclaim his marvelous deeds to all the nations. Worship the Holy Lord. Worship the Lord in holy attire. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord is king. He governs the peoples with equity. Proclaim his marvelous deeds to all the nations. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit. There are different forms of service, but the same Lord. There are different workings, but the same God who produces all of them in everyone. To each individual, the manifestation of the spirit is given for some benefit. To one is given through the spirit, the expression of wisdom. To another, the expression of knowledge, according to the same spirit. To another, faith, by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing, by the one spirit. To another, mighty deeds. To another, prophecy. To another, discernment of spirits. To another, varieties of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. But one and the same spirit produces all of these, distributing them individually to each person as he wishes. The word of the Lord. Our gospel reading comes from the gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. There was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. When the wine ran short, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, how does your concern affect me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servers, do whatever he tells you. Now, there were six stone water jars there for Jewish ceremonial washings, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told them, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it. And when the head waiter tasted the water that had become wine without knowing where it had come from, although the servers who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves good wine first. And then when the people have drunk freely, an inferior one, but you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this as the beginning of his signs at Cana in Galilee, and so revealed his glory, and his disciples began to believe in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So many things to reflect upon today, and I do want to just look and listen to some of the words that jump out in each of the readings one of the themes that, that comes to me really comes from the first reading from Isaiah, the Lord delights in you. We see a lot about the wonder of God. We see a wonderful, joyful occasion of a wedding come to a joyful climax with this amazing and most miraculous miracle, the first miracle of Jesus. And we just see this overflowing of abundant love from our God. In the first reading from Isaiah chapter 62, verses one through five, there's a couple of lines that just pop out to me that remind me and just really symbolize to me the, the transformation, the that when we encounter the Lord and we turn our hearts to the Lord, he transforms us, that we become anew. And we talked about that a little bit in the baptism of Jesus, when we are baptized as Christians in the Christian church, when we're born, we are a creation of God. But yet when we're baptized with that holy water, in the form of, uh, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we become then children of God. So not just creatures, uh, 
but now we are God's own. And here this says, you shall be called by a new name. You shall be a glorious crown in the hand of the Lord. Don't you want to be a glorious crown in the hand of our Lord, a royal diadem held by your God? I love this for the Lord delights in you. And we hear this language of uh, an endearing, passionate love between a groom and his bride. You know, you shall be called my delight. You will be espoused as a young man marries a virgin, your builder. And in, in this version of the scripture, the word builder is capitalized with the capital B, your builder, your creator, your creator shall marry you. And so your God rejoice in you. It's just this beautiful reminder of the love, the fulfillment God has for us, how much that we are loved in the Lord, no matter what happens in our lives, no matter where we turn. And so many times because we are in sin that we turn away, but how much we are loved. And I think there are times in our lives where we may feel we're not loved. And I just want you to go back to that scripture for the Lord delights in you for the Lord delights in you. You know, we're going to see this manifest how much the Lord delights in us in this example, in, in the land of Cana in Galilee, in the scripture reading, the Psalms again are so beautiful. And, and many times the Psalms remind me this is how we are to respond with such love. I mean, that love that God gives to us, his abundant love, his overflowing in love has nothing to do with what I've done, has nothing to do with how good I am today. It's all about God's love. God is love. He is love. It pours out from him onto us, his creatures. And so how do we respond? Proclaim his marvelous deeds to all the nations that because we're loved, because we're a creation of God, and in our baptism, we are sons and daughters of God, we should share how God works marvelous deeds in our lives. He gives us life. He gives us breath. He gives us our family. He gives us opportunities. Well, here in St. Paul, he gives us those spiritual gifts that give to the Lord, the glory due his name, that as a response, as gratitude, as thankfulness to recognize how marvelous God is in my life. And, and those are the personal testimonies that people need to hear. People need to hear that God's done something beautiful in your life. It doesn't have to be, he turned water into wine, but he does turn wine into his blood. Every time we go to the Holy Eucharist and receive him, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Wow. But just in your daily life, think about through the course of your life, through your childhood, through your high school years, if you've gone to college, served in the military, in your careers, in your family life, whatever you might be doing today, how has the Lord blessed you? Think about it. Put those memories, those particular significant moments into a treasure box that you're willing to share those treasures. When people might be in doubt, of the Lord, people might not be encouraged and they need to hear a word of encouragement, not just a story, but your true experience of the Lord working in your life. In the letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians, and we're reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians chapter 12, it's really beautiful to hear about these different spiritual gifts. And it's certainly emphasized many times that it's the same spirit. It's the same Lord, but each of us are doled out something different depending upon how, how we were made, how, what we, maybe our vocation that, that we're given different gifts, not that mine's better than yours or yours is better than mine or his is better than hers or anything like that. But I love how at the very end it says, but one and the same spirit produces all of these, distributes them individually 
to you. You get a particular gift to each person as the spirit wishes. And so I know in my case, sometimes I look at a, um, I might particular think of a girlfriend of mine who has a really great gift for teaching, for writing. Oh, she's such a great writer. Oh, how is she able to do all of that? Um, I have a good, a good friend who's just great at graphic design and she just puts things out and they're just beautiful and they're attractive and they, they call you to a message that is all about the Lord. And I think, oh, why, why can't I have that gift? But but give praise to God that she received that gift, that he received that gift. How wonderful that is. And to not be jealous of another person's gift or to say, oh, Holy Spirit, give me that gift and that gift, but to be looking at ourselves, what's the gift that I've been given? How am I using that to some benefit? You know, think about those things that are natural for you, that you do well, ways you interact with people, ways in which you communicate with others, ways in which you think, write, whatever it might be. Listen and know that those are gifts from the spirit. Yes, we can pray for certain gifts of the Holy Spirit, certainly, but to recognize that we've been given a spirit, a gift to give glory to God, to help and serve others. And I think St. Paul in this letter is really helping to encourage me today, even though he's encouraging the Corinthians in their day, uh, note that it's from the Holy Spirit. It's from the same spirit that everybody receives these gifts. It shouldn't divide us. It should unify us that we contribute those gifts to others. Okay. The gospel reading today and John as he opens up the gospel and we hear the wonderful proclamation, you know, in with the word, there was God and, and we hear this beautiful uh, prologue, so to speak. And we hear about John the Baptist and his saying, you know, the lamb of God is coming. And then all of a sudden we get to Jesus on the scene and he is invited with his disciples along with Mary. Now it sounds like Mary was invited first. We don't really know all of the details of the story, but we see this beautiful gathering of a family, of the neighbors, of the community to celebrate this wedding. And what I love about this is that Mary's the one who notices. Now, there's certainly a lot of family. There's certainly close friends to both the groom and the, and the bride here, but Mary's the one to notice that the, the wine ran short. And as soon as she notices there's something lacking, and this is a big lack for the couple, for their family, that they are expected to provide probably for over a week, all of the hospitality, the food and the spirits and all of the beautiful uh, choice wines and foods that they would be providing for their guests. And there would be many. And this is something big that has been planned for a long time. And all of a sudden, Mary notices, oh my, they're running out of wine and we still have many days left in the party. And if they run out of wine, they are going to be embarrassed for the rest of their life. They will never live this down. And so she just takes the concern, who? To her son, Jesus. We don't know what other words were spoken between them. You can only imagine, particularly if you are a mother and you have a firstborn son, the way that a mother might look directly in the eyes of her child to communicate what words can't communicate, you know, this urgency, son, this is important. They have no wine. She's just stating the facts. She's not asking him to do anything. It's not in a question. It's simply in a statement. They have no wine. And she knows the ramifications. She knows the consequences to her dear friends. And she takes that concern directly to her son. And we hear Jesus say, you know, what does this have to do with me? My time has not come. And we know we'll hear more about Jesus referring to his time which means his passion, his death, and ultimately his resurrection. But that time of his giving of himself is not yet come. Almost to say, if we begin now the battle, mother, 
Are you ready for the change that will happen? Because we know at this moment, if Jesus begins a public ministry, he won't be living at home quietly with his mother, taking care of her and all of her needs anymore. Her life will drastically change and she won't just be the mother of Jesus. She will become the mother of all. And she'll have to live a new life with Jesus out on the road with the disciples following his mission to follow his father. All of this is, is just interior to the story of Mary calling out the divinity of her son, Jesus. And so Jesus goes and we hear about the Jewish ceremonial washing uh, stone jars, which are meant for purification of water for the purification ceremonies that would happen. And that these six stone jars, which would hold, you know, 30 gallons each times six is 180 gallons of wine. <laughs> Can you imagine? I, I hope that they didn't go through 180 gallons of wine in their, in their wedding, but here, this first miracle in a public setting happens. Now, what's interesting here is we know that the head, head waiter recognizes that something miraculous has happened. I mean, they have great wine here. How did that happen? The servants know. We drew water. We put it in those stone jars. Now, as the water comes out, it's this most luscious, wonderful, choice wine. And we saw what happened, that Jesus was there. They know there was a miracle. And somehow word must have gotten around to the disciples because at the end, it says, Jesus did this at the beginning of his signs at Cana in Galilee and so revealed his glory and his disciples began to believe in him. Because in the first part of John, we just hear uh, Andrew and Peter and Nathaniel and Philip. Those are the four disciples that are being mentioned in the book of John before we get to this story. And so there are at least four, maybe five or six that are with him that we hear about. And so Jesus has this small group of disciples that will follow him, but they haven't seen any signs or wonders yet. And now we see this miracle. Here's Jesus's mother. Here's this water turned into wine. And now I like this. The disciples began, they're starting to see something's different about this Jesus. We're hearing about it. Uh, we've heard about the prophecy of the Messiah. John the Baptist says he's the Messiah. And, and, and they're starting to see and recognize something different is going on here. And I think that's something that we should reevaluate in our own lives. Is my faith in God, in Jesus Christ, something different than living my daily life, than doing the things that I do each day and my family and my work and my ministry and, and whatever vocation, is this something significant? Is there something different? about this faith, my faith in Christ beyond all other things? And do I treat it that way? Do I regard myself as a delight in God's eye? And I think we can learn, at least I'm trying to learn from Mary, that Mary brought what was lacking to the attention of her son. And we know that Mary in her role as Mary, mother of God, Mary, helper of all Christians, as we just prayed today, Mary, undoer of knots, that Mary brings the lack. She brings the concern. She brings the fact <laughs> he has cancer. They're considering divorce. She's sick. He hasn't been able to get a job in six months. They're poor. They're going to lose their house. They have leprosy. I mean, go on and on with those facts of deficiencies of what is lacking. She's lacking her health. He's lacking the ability to provide for his family. They're lacking hope. They're lacking courage. 
They're lacking strength. And Mary brings that to the Lord, not to tell the Lord what to do, but she simply turns it over and trusts. And this is why she says, do whatever he tells you. So whatever he inspires you, he prompts you with those gifts of the Holy Spirit. As as St. Paul talks about, you know, we're given those gifts for a reason, maybe to be an advocate for somebody in our family, somebody in our community that needs help, that maybe can't think straight right now because they're going through difficulty to be able to help in a certain way, to be able to listen, to be a friend, to be a companion along the way, not to be one who judges, not to be one who compares, not to be one who belittles, but one who befriends and who gives hope and joy to another. Everyone serves good wine first, but when the people have drunk freely an inferior one, you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus is the good wine. He turns the water into wine in this example in Cana. And the whole Eucharist is wine turned into the blood of Christ. That blood of Christ is true life. It's eternal life. You know, the wine for the people, the Hebrew people, the Israelites, you know, represented joyfulness, happiness. If you had the good wine, that was um, a blessing. And it would be not a blessing if you ran out of good wine in this story. That's one of the things Mary, I think, was probably concerned about is that if they lacked wine, that would be a lack of hope, a a lack of joy, a lack of happiness. And and possibly people would think, well, this is a somewhat of a curse, or maybe God is taking away blessings from your family. But no, that beautiful choice wine, the best wine, the head waiter recognizes this is something unusual. The transformation that Jesus directed in his divinity, turning that simple wine in purification jars into the most choice or water, into the most choice wine. He wants to transform us as well into his espoused, into his delight by taking us as his bride, the church. He is our groom, our bridegroom, and we, the church, are his bride. And so as we do prepare ourselves to receive Jesus in the Holy Eucharist, we receive that miracle of wine turning into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. He gave everything for us. Jesus' blood turns our shame, our embarrassment, our our problems of the day, our knots into a joy. And he sacrificed everything for love of us. The eternal price is his gift of life for us. Out of his abundance of love, out of God's abundance of love, Jesus gave everything. And so let us go to Mary, the mother of all. When we experience a lack, how many times have we just felt like we're at our wits end? I just don't know how to solve this problem. I don't know how to deal with this person. I don't know where the next paycheck is going to come to pay for this bill. I don't know how to deal with this cancer, this treatment. I don't know how to deal with this or that in my work situation, in my marriage, in my vocation, when we feel like we're in a lack, let's just bring it to Mary and ask her to give it to her Lord. And I know she will say, do whatever he tells you. Reflect upon those spiritual gifts that you've been given. Just one, just one gift that the Holy Spirit has given you. It comes from the same Lord that transformed simple water into wine to bring joy and to transform a family into a bride for Christ. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever, world without end. Amen.
I want to close with this prayer. And it's a prayer that I wrote as I was looking into the new year. And so I'll just close and invite you to think about those things that the Lord is working on through you. Lord, into your hands, I place these things, all the magazine articles, all the radio shows, all the podcasts, all the video recordings, all the website projects, all my loved ones, all those who have asked for my prayers, all the interviews, all our home projects, all those living with cancer, all who are caring for the sick and needy loved ones, and all the retreats and live streams. Help me to know what to do, what not to do, and to be at peace always, trusting in your divine will. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. I'll look forward to talking with you again next week.